But um, um, our moderator, Laura Benedetto, said I should tell you a little bit of my experience with Self Help Credit Union. Um, before, when Self Help was just a gleam in Bonnie and Martin's eyes, there was a brand new little foundation called the Fund for Southern Communities. And I was on one of the founding boards. And one of the first grants we gave was sort of like an exploratory grant for Self Help. Is that something like that? And yeah. then. $3,000. I knew it was $5,000. You said $5,000. I knew it wasn't at, at, their, <laughs> annual, at their annual birthday party because we didn't give anybody $5,000 back then. <laughs> um, but, um, and then it turned out that a few years later, my partner Raymond, I got the first house loan that um, self-help gave, and we also got the first equity line that they gave. <laughs> and it was kind of a learning experience for everybody involved, and it was just... Um, Really, really a wonderful experience. And when I think about all the amazing things that have happened in Durham over the past 10 years, so many things, if you really trace them back, go to self-help. And just recently, um, our wonderful new co-op grocery wouldn't be possible without their help. And I just found out that the Pauline Murray House has made it through the first hurdle to become a national monument. Mm -hmm. And it was saved by self-help. So... Welcome with me, Lori Benedetto, who joined Self-Help as employee number 16 in 1989 and helped grow Self-Help's commercial lending program and now leads the development policy and impact team. Welcome with me, the Self-Help Credit Union Program. Thank you. So I'm going to... Um, uh, overview what we're going to do in the next uh, bit of time and then give brief introductions for each of the panelists and then we'll begin with uh, some moderated questions and answers here from uh, us up here and then uh, after about a half hour or so we'll open it up to questions uh, from you all and answers from the panelists. So um, Lou Myers to my left is a long-standing board member of self-help um, as well as the Humanities Foundation of the Library. He came to North Carolina to work on Soul City in Warren County, North Carolina. By day, Lou is principal and the director of business development at Perkins and Will, an architectural firm that includes uh, Phil Freelon's practice. Bonnie Wright and Martin Eakes, professional and personal partners, <laughs> uh, founded Self Help in 1980, I think, as most of you know. Uh, Bonnie was the founding uh, president of Self-Help Credit Union. In the 1990s, she moved uh, to the board of Self-Help and did diversity training outside of uh, our organization. She helped to start the Maureen Joy Charter School here in East Durham and now is a senior fellow at MDC where she focuses on passing gear philanthropy and early childhood success. She also works as a coach and consultant beyond MDC with many leaders of nonprofits and government agencies. Martin is CEO of Self Help and our various affiliate, affiliated credit unions, real estate arms, advocacy and research group, the Center for Responsible Lending, <laughs> among other things. Uh, and um, he also serves on the board of the Ford Foundation and several bank community development committees. Uh, Thad Day Moore is, it's not quite clear if he's employee number three or four, or maybe <laughs> even number one, depending on how you define employee. But Thad was right there at the beginning. Recruited to work on worker ownership initiatives, he was hired from a Greensboro scrapyard, <laughs> <laughs> where he uh, recycled iron and steel um, uh, and put it to, helped it get onto a new path. Like Bonnie and Martin, um, he's worn many hats, including being president of the credit union. He's currently focused on our um, self-help faith initiatives. And last but not least, I want to introduce Kristen Cox. Kristen, you want to raise your hand? Kristen was at our table, and uh, Joanne was, has long wanted to do this, but it was Kristen that actually got it on people's schedule. So thank you, Kristen. 
Um, Kristen works with individuals and like-minded organizations that are depositors at our credit unions. She came to us in 2011, employee number 400 and something, uh, and uh, she came with 14 years of working with nonprofits and uh, community development credit unions in Chicago. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lou, who's gonna give an overview of self-help, uh, just kind of who we are today, and then we'll get go into the history and some probing questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. I am chair of the Center for Community Self-Help Board. That is, if you will, the parent corporation. So I guess Martin works for me, although <laughs> I don't know that Martin works for anybody. <laughs> and we're blessed that he doesn't. Uh, but, uh, and as you can tell, you know, Martin is just really shy, but in our prep session, I just wanted to get across the point that self-help is a truly significant institution, not only coming out of Durham, but what it has done for this country. And, you know, oftentimes because, you know, we're involved, we don't get that kind of perspective. But I'm old. Um, I've been around a long time. And I've seen a lot of things happen. And, you know, I mean, I've seen students and young people stop a war. Uh, you know, just all kinds of things have happened. But this is just critical. And um, one of the reasons is, I think, just what it has done and, and its mission. And I wanted to just take a moment uh, just to go through that mission real quick and give you some of the highlights of just what we have here in Durham, and um, I suspect that Martin will be somewhat embarrassed, but it's just it's stuff that we need to know, and we need to celebrate this. I mean, we really need to celebrate it. We talk about the research trying to par. We talk about other kinds of things, but in the space, in the space that self-help exists, you know, we certainly are, you know, market leaders, you know, when people want to, you know, measure themselves about who does it best, you know, we're certainly at the top, and that's something we need to be proud of. But um, our mission is creating and protecting ownership and economic opportunity for all, especially people of color, women, rural residents, and low-wealth families and communities. We do this by providing responsible financial services, lending to small businesses and nonprofits, developing real estate, and promoting uh, fair financial practices. Um, and we'll talk about how this touches folks. But self-help now, over 600 employees uh, in North Carolina, in California, in Chicago, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Center for Responsible Lending was an organization that was created by self-help and all of this predatory lending and these ugly things that have happened, the one organization that has been standing on that line has been uh, CRL. And again, that's significant because one of the things that self-help proved is that low-income folk can be responsible with loans, they get loans, they pay the loans back, and all of the wealth that self-help itself did and perpetuated and fostered. So much of that was wiped out by the crazy things that happened, but this is not about preaching. Um, but again, if self-help isn't there, you know, how do these things happen? Who's going to fill that space? So I'm, I'm gonna stop there because I had some other kinds of uh, statistics, but I don't need to do that. But this is an organization that, you know, we just, really, really, really need to appreciate for all that it has done and what it continues to do. And if folks want some of that, uh, that, that those facts, there is an annual report and other materials in the back, so grab it on your way out. We wouldn't be who we are if it weren't for you all. Um, so I just thought before we actually begin uh, with our first uh, question, would raise your hand if you're a member or depositor at Self Help. Raise your hand if you're a staff member or board member of self-help. 
How about a borrower? <laughs> uh, how about if you've ever been in a building that we financed or developed? <laughs> Did I get everybody? Is there anybody that hasn't raised their hand? <laughs> well, we'll have to talk after. Um, so, to get us started, Bonnie, um, how did self-help get started, and um, what was it like in the early days? Okay. Um, well, thanks for being here, everyone. So, um, the title of this is Humble, humble, uh, is it humble Beginnings, a Humble History, and we did have actually very humble beginnings, which um, c compared to some of the things that Laura and Lou were talking about, um, you might not think, but the germination of the idea for self-help actually came from um, conversations in a very rundown building in Washington, D.C., in a living room with Martin and myself and our college friends. And we spent hours upon hours talking about how are we going to save the world together, the group of us. And um, we wore each other out, and so by the end of it, it was just me and Martin. <laughs> and, um, and so we made our way to Durham, and um, we were both wild-eyed, and Martin was wild-haired. And um, we had decided that um, the, the, the bottom line was that we believed that the economic sphere was the place to take the civil rights movement. And that we believe that people should have uh, control over their economic futures. And so we decided that we would embark on the very likely strategy of worker co-ops in plant closing situations. And so, um, and the, the setting here in 1980 was, um, it was really pretty dreadful, and some of you all will definitely remember this, um, if, you, if any of you are as old as we are. Um, um, very dire in terms of the plant closing situation in North Carolina. There were uh, the textile um, industry and the furniture industry in particular were being really um, decimated. And it was also the beginning of the Reagan era. So not only were the, um, those industries being decimated, but also the nonprofit sector and the governmental sectors were being cut um, dramatically. So that was the setting. But we, um, we were very um, bright-eyed and idealistic. And a lot of people told us it wouldn't work, and we just thought they were old and jaded. And so, you know, for any youngsters in the crowd, um, I would advise you to, you know, when the old, older people are telling you some advice, you know, listen to some of it. So don't, don't listen to enough to not do what you want to do, but you might want to listen to a little bit of it, because some of it turned out to be correct. <laughs> so we went down the um, North Carolina roads in our little Volkswagen bug. And I don't know why anybody listened to us at all, but we, you know, we, we did work with communities um, providing technical assistance after plant closings to people that wanted to start worker-owned businesses. Now, the first one we worked with was in New Bern, and that was a very, um, very racially divided community. Um, the plant that was there was called Texfi, and that was a polyester plant. So you can imagine that there wasn't much future in polyester at that point. And so what came out of that was a small bakery. And um, it was really, it was a very, even though it was a very small venture, I think it was a turning point in people's lives for the first time that, you know, people, you know, I think the reason that people did listen to us is because it was the first time that people were believed in them and said, you can do this, you, know, you can have some control over your future, and we're behind you, and we'll help you find the resources to do that. We also worked in Lincoln to North Carolina, which is on the other side of the state towards Charlotte. That's a place where some of you know, that was, that's Klan territory. Um, this was a group of black and white workers. They had never been in the same room together outside of the workplace. And they really didn't know how to talk to each other, um, but they, they were willing to give it a shot. Um, another place that we worked was in Alamance County in Burlington, and that was Alamance Sock Factory. And Thad can tell you many war stories from that place. He, he invested lots of blood, sweat, and tears. Um, and he brought home lots of socks to lots of... <laughs> so I think Martin is still wearing some of those socks. <laughs> um, so we had, you know, we, we, we burned up a lot of... Um, well, we burned up a lot of miles and we burned up one car. <laughs> but um, it, we, we learned a lot and one thing that we learned was that we were in the right arena. You know, the economic arena is where we needed to be. Um, we were the, it was, you know, humble in terms of our beginnings. We were, we grew slowly. Um, 
we did we did try to learn from our mistakes and also from our small successes. Um, we also, I think the the core of who self help has turned out to be was born in those days, which is really learning um, how critical the role of capital is, both in terms of the formation of self help, um, in terms of uh, wealth development, in terms of family security, and also. Um, in terms of, uh, I was going to say something else about capital, just in terms of wealth accumulation and family security, basically. And finally, I think we were just just beginning glim to get glimpses of how um, important it was going to be to embark on structural change and policy change. And we, we really didn't have a good picture of that yet, but I think we were just getting the glimpses of that in the early days. So. Thanks, Bonnie. So Lou and Thad, how did you guys get involved with self-help? Um. Um, I came to North Carolina in 71, as you said, at Seoul City, um, and in 1970, I married Floyd's oldest daughter, Joycelyn, and I was working up at um, the Graduate School of Education at Harvard, and Joycelyn was a student there, and Floyd told me in 1970, he said, Lou, if people think that getting equal public accommodations or the right to vote was difficult, they haven't seen anything until they try to get a piece of the action. I mean, Floyd said that we're in a capitalistic system. If you don't have capital, you can't play. And, you know, that just resonated with me. And he said that, you know, the next step in the civil rights movement has to be about economic growth, jobs development, uh, because, you know, it, it was just a natural place. So, that was one. Secondly, uh, when I agreed to come to Seoul City, uh, Floyd gave me a book and told me, you need to read this book. It was by Lou Kelso, and it was about worker-owned cooperatives, because if you're poor and don't have a lot of money, co-ops are a viable strategy. So I read that, and then I get to North Carolina. Anyhow, Seoul City bellied up in 79, uh, and I went into state government um, and ran the um, small business program and the minority business program. And one of the people that we were working with at Seoul City was Wasco, a worker-owned sewing company out in Bertie County. And so I knew Tim Baysmore and those folk and a number of other folk. And so that's where I really learned about self-help through what they were doing, the kinds of services and the work that they were doing with them. Um, with, um, that particular uh, group of folks. So it was right in 1980 that I really became familiar with them. So I've got a bit of a story, and y'all hang with me here. It's gonna sound like I'm going around the bend, but I promise to <laughs> pull it together some way. Uh, about when my son was 15 years old, so this would have been, is he going through? It would have been 1995 or so. He asked me once, he said, had I ever seen a miracle? And I said, well, other than meeting your mother and getting married to her, <laughs> I'm not sure. And then I thought about it. I said, maybe I have. And let me tell you a story. And I told him about how uh, I had, was at a place, this was around 1977, where I had done community organizing with the Brown Lung Associations. I'd gone to seminary, and I kind of was playing out this mission that I'd felt like I'd been called to, some sort of service all for all my life. And I was at a place of deciding, where am I going next? And it was a real tough place. Um, one of the things that occurred for me, fortunately, as I was in that place, was I did a lot of reading and I got really engrossed with E.F. Schumacher's Small is Beautiful. I don't know if any of you remember that book, but he talked a lot about worker ownership in that book and really got me fired up. And I started reading more and said, oh, well, this is interesting. And so we were, when I moved to Greensboro to be closer to my wife, Susan, I met a guy whose father owned a scrap metal business and he was still, he, the son was running it and the son said, well, I'm really into wanting to miss becoming a worker on business. I was like, Me, yeehaw. I mean, it's like, I'm, I'll come to work there. Well, you can play it two ways. Never a more dismal thing could have been said, 
or maybe a more wonderful thing could have been said because to some degree it was a, by all outward appearances, it was a dead move. Um, it was for about five years. I worked there cutting steel, getting burned, uh, getting dirty, getting muscles, uh, uh, running into all kinds of crazy characters. And there's some, there's some odd people that live out there in the working world, I have to tell you. Uh, guy, there's one guy who had a habit. He would come to work drunk and he would lean on this alligator shear. This, which exactly what you think it is. There's this big contraption that goes up and down and you stick big pieces of steel and it chops it. He would lean on this thing as it went up and down because he was so drunk, <laughs> feeding the seal to it. <laughs> uh, and th 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 this is my wife can testify. That's just the tip of the iceberg. But any of that, um, uh, there there was just nothing happening. And I and I really I have friends of mine who are saying social justice friends are saying, "What are you doing, bud? <laughs> Where are you going with this?" My, my wife's father thought I was an idiot. Uh, and for sure, if I had walked around that scrapyard and talked to the guys in that scrapyard and started talking about worker ownership, I, I might as well have been wearing a coat hanger on my head. It, it, was, it was, would have been a no, blow, no win whatsoever. Uh, so I really had some real, I mean, it was pretty painful there. And then one thing there I read, there was a, the, the mystic Thomas Merton, who was a, uh, Many of you may know who was uh, just way ahead of his time in lots of ways. He started engagements with the Dalai Lama and other, other Buddhists and wrote some marvelous words. And one of his words I remember he said was, the hallmark of a call is persistent energy in the face of obstacles. Well, I certainly could testify to that. That was, <laughs> it, I was, see, it was both were true. Well, little did I know was that these two, about the same time, were hatching in, in Washington, D.C. and other places, uh, this idea of coming back to North Carolina to do worker ownership work. I had no idea about that until uh, we connected. I forget how it was, but they had the first worker ownership conference. Uh, it was in down east at Elks Lodge. What was it? Winton. Win Winton. North Carolina. It was a few days after Ronald Reagan was elected, so there was a bit of a kind of a moment of a funeral dir dirge to some degree, along with, by golly, we got this thing we got going. Um, and then later, um, uh, these folks uh, offered me a nice job for self help, and my wife and I decided to move on the basis of 18 months of promised salary to loot and sell our house and move to Durham with our daughter and go to work and it was uh and my recollection as i pull back from that and i see who could have thought that i would have had that kind of sense of call that it would have been fulfilled by connecting with martin and bonnie that in fact what it was we saw ourselves doing was itself going to be transformed into an incredible vehicle for social progress that could be called serendipity. I call it a miracle. <laughs> so, Tad, keep the microphone, if you would, and tell us about how we became, how Self Help became a credit union, sure. and a little bit about some of the work that we do with other credit unions. Yeah. Okay. So, before I leave, what I was just saying, the one thing I want to, one thing is n rarely, if ever, acknowledged in any of our circles is how much time that Martin and Bonnie donated to forming this organization and keeping it going through its first early years. And I know you don't want to be heroes, but thank you for all that you did. <laughs> so the self-help credit, the first time I heard it, the idea of a credit union was in the, everybody remember the Palms restaurant? here in downtown. We were in the Palms restaurant and Martin said he wanted to form a credit union. Of course, he and Bonnie already been plotting on it, I know. But it was the first time I'd ever heard the word. I didn't know. I thought it was like a consumer thing or it was a union. But I quickly learned. And what I learned, and I'll say to those of you who might not know, <laughs> like I didn't know at the time, a credit union is a cooperative. It is a consumer-owned financial vehicle, the members of a credit union 
or people who, who, make, who uh, have loans or deposits, and they, in order to, be, to do that, they have to be a member, and it's a one person, one vote to a credit union. Now, we very much were aware of the credit union world that we were getting into. We also were very conscious of the world of worker cooperatives in the Mondragon region of Spain. Now, if I'm talking gobbledygook, you could be forgiven because it's not widely known. But in, in, in the Mondragon region of Spain, in Basque, there is still, it was then and still is, a thriving worker cooperative movement. It was inspired by a Roman Catholic priest. Uh, 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 worker cooperatives are a prominent part of Catholic social teaching. Um, so they're at the, I don't know what, how many there are now, but at the time, this is when we were all excited, we were like 80 co-ops. Do you know how many there are? But in any event, the, the, one of the most important, if not the most important vehicle for these co cooperatives was the, the cooperative bank that was behind them. And this bank was what they called a second degree co-op, and that is because half of their board of directors were elected by the people who worked in the bank, and the other half was elected by the co uh, each of the worker cooperatives. We adapted that to some degree and have ourselves two classes of members. The one class are those people who are just like state employees credit union. They're, they're the people who have a deposit or an account with them. The other class is the, uh, are those of the folks who work at self-help. They're called worker members, and they elect the other class of members. Um, so that, for us, that was an important kind of concession to what it was we're trying to do. As it turned out, as that moved forward, uh, the worker cooperative part of our work, and we can touch on this, began to fade and became, what got, became more prominent was our lending. And what we really, I think, our big aha moment was in the second half of the 80s was, and it was a little bit of a yeehaw moment, to be honest with you, <laughs> uh, there was a sense that we had a great opportunity for people who wanted to take their money, that may be idle money, in a money market or an IRA or a CD, to get a decent rate of return totally safe, and they would know that that money was being used to make home mortgage loans and business loans to people of need, whether that had been African Americans, to Latinos, to women, to other, to communities of poverty. That's what we were about, and we really did that quite successfully. There were a few, um, um, wrinkles in the garment as things went on. And, and I'll tell these because these are nice, cute stories, but they're illustrative. Uh, one of those is, without getting too much in credit union arcania, is the fact that we were a state chartered credit union, which means we are recognized as a credit union in North Carolina laws. We were also federal, our, our, our deposits were federally insured by the National Credit Union Administration. NCUA is the jargon we use, and they and we uh, we uh, as a regulated credit institution would receive audits or exams is the word that they use in credit union land and banking land uh, of of our books of our loans etc. And they would generally be done to the other. Well, one of the fierce outcomes, and there'll be others we'll allude to of the Reagan administration era. Well, there were some Neanderthal regulators and administrators, and they gave us a vicious time over the fact that we were doing commercial loans. Uh, there was, uh, I, I was, I, when I would be in these exec, uh, exit conference and exams, I'd be kind of having my head kind of low, <laughs> listen to Martin and Bonnie go toe-to-toe go -to -toe with these people on some various issues. Uh, there finally came a point where uh, they sent in their so-called, their, their Southeast expert on consumer on commercial loans to review us and the guy came in uh, he was from louisiana and he examined the books and we got into the exit conference and he said you all do it right <laughs> it was like <laughs> i remember saying can you kind of go to the microphone there and he said i don't mind i'll say it out loud it was great <laughs> he came away we just like 
I don't know if you remember what you remember. I was just saying, like, that was a great moment. It really was. And what I heard, I got to know the guy later because he introduced us, uh, introduced me to a, a credit union like us in, in New Orleans, his turf. And he told me, he said later, that he had been told by the senior administrators to shut us down. And that was one of the ugly kind of stories there. So it's not all, I, I can say, there's not all kind of... Uh, blaming the regulators. We had our own set of faults. There, uh, one memory I have, and we, Martin and Bonnie and I kind of reminisced about this a week ago, is at one point we were, had a, a, an examination coming up and, in a few weeks, and we knew that we were out of balance by $600,000. Now, by any reckoning, I don't care what you think, that's a lot of money. <laughs> And it was certainly a lot of money relative to our size at that point. So the three of us spent night after night, late nights, reconciling. Martin, I remember you had put together some kind of protocol for doing the comparisons. And it was just like chasing things round and round. And I remember, forget, one night, late at night, Martin and I, was like 2 a.m., and we were in this room doing this work, and Martin looked over at me and he said, it's like Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> the, the only part I remember is I was about to have a baby, so. <laughs> and uh, you, fortunately, I didn't remember. You remember the moment when we got to $17,000. And we thought, well, we can get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So continuing the credit union story, and y'all y'all interrupt me if I'm getting too long here. Um, one of the other strong motifs that was, was a credit union factor was, was that we discovered there was a great legacy of African American credit unions that existed well before we even had a pipe dream about this. There, were at one, there was one point 25 African -American credit, American credit unions in North Carolina in the 70s, more than any other state in the country. These are credit unions that were formed in Jim Crow era by teachers, ministers, farmers, funeral home director. It just goes on and on, all kind of in the face of fierce opposition from the dominant community. Um, and done in, with in remarkable dedication, kind of while, you know, the doctor's credit union was operated out of the back of his office. Um, these were amazing institutions. Sadly, the 80s were not kind to them, and I think there are a lot of factors involved. And, and uh, one is the fact that we're facing aging leadership. The other was uh, there was competition to some degree from the conventional sector, but also there's no question that there's racism going on. Uh, I like, in terms of what we saw going on from NCUA, uh, there was at the very least this sort of sense of you don't matter to at the, at the best, to at the very lowest, just outright bigotry. Uh, so we lost a lot of credit unions, I think, that we're convinced. Had we been more engaged, uh, they would still be around. But that's you know, the west water of the bridge, unfortunately. Maybe that's a good segue to Lou. And how is self-help a civil rights organization? Well, it ties into what Julie told me in 1997. Yes, right. <laughs> it ties back to what Floyd had told me in 1970 about just the struggle, and this was the next stage of the struggle, that you flat out needed to have money. And when I was in state government, um, 80 to 88, uh, working with minority-owned businesses, working with folk like Jimmy Gillum over at the uh, St. Luke Credit Union and other folk, because capital was the largest uh, barrier to getting into business and trying to be successful in business. And again, self-help was, you know, one of the, the games in, in town that, that you could take advantage with. And they were sensitive and willing to work. And, you know, they were just good, you know, principled folk that understood uh, what we were going through. So, I mean, from that, that standpoint, it was just very, very, very consistent. Um, and I think that, I guess, 
I don't know, I, the first board I served on was the Self Help Ventures Fund board because I think we were over on Chapel Hill Street, the Addison Building. Well, I used to park in that alley there when going to board meetings, and lo and behold, I live in the building that I used to park behind in the alley. <laughs> so every time I go down there, I think about it. But uh, I was on the self help board, and um, you know, but you know, when you're when you're struggling and there aren't a lot of resources, and you have an entity that is about, you know, helping, and there were no egos. People were just, you know, how do we solve this problem? So they were fun to work with. They were committed. Um, and the one thing I do remember, I guess it was in 85 when Governor Martin came in, I was asked to stay, and I stayed on. But I remember uh, one day, Martin, um, we went down, I think it was you, and I don't know if it was Bob, I think it was Dave McGrady, uh, but we went in a car because I was working in the Commerce Department, and we went to, I think, Planners Bank and BB&T and what was it, People's Bank. You know, I'm Assistant Secretary, so I could get in the door, and you know, these guys, you know, made the pitch, and, um, but you know, you've got to support an organization like this because it was mission driven and it was just, you know, it, it was just, I guess the miracle uh, that is that, you know, it was here at that time doing these kinds of things. I would never have expected to find that here, just never would have. So it's just been um, a very powerful organization and very consistent. In the interest of time, I'm going to jump around a little bit from our, our plan. Um, and Martin, self-help has many principles that have guided our development and, and operations. Tithing is a pretty important one. Would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, but I never followed directions very well, so <laughs> I want to have a couple of reaction comments uh, first. The thing I can say with great certainty is Thad's comment about your father-in-law thinking you're an idiot, that's a universal <laughs> truth. <laughs> Don't you think? Um, Take the mic from him. <laughs> well, they may be wait because they know if I ever get a mic and start preaching, it's, uh, it's a sad time from there. The other thing is I started laughing when I saw the title of this, A Humble History. We should have been a whole lot more humble in the beginning than we were. Uh, our first grant proposal was how we were going to reconcile socialism and capitalism. <laughs> so we had great ambitions, we had great idealism, but we didn't know a damn thing. So, you know, it turned out that we got more humble as time went on because we learned some things. But we also learned things that were worth fighting for. And so, one of the things for me personally is I grew up with really red, long hair down to my shoulders when we started out, and I had a really hot temper. And the truth is now I've realized I've lost all of my red hair, but I still have the same temper that I had when we started. And so there is good that can come out of just getting pissed off. And I just want to say that. I think it's for my first 15 years at self-help, I really worked to try to be a good person. I tried to be a nicer person. And then I finally realized I was put on this earth to fight. And for communities that are voiceless, uh, they need someone to fight for them. So I've sort of come to terms with the fact that I'm just not necessarily a nice person all the time. Uh, Bonnie mentioned the project that we worked on in Lincolnton, and in 1979, some of you who are old enough to remember, there was a group of people who came from Lincolnton to Greensboro, and they shot and killed activists who were largely from Durham uh, in Greensboro. And self-help started three or four months later after that event, so this was very much in our mind when we got a call to come to Lincolnton and help this group of workers deal with what they thought was an injustice. And the call that we received was this. They said, we've got an owner of a factory that has shut down the factory who didn't pay the workers for the last six weeks of work. 
And the way that had worked is the factory owner got to a point where he was $100,000 behind on his payroll taxes. He went to his lawyer, and the lawyer said, if you're going to shut down, you need to do this in a very precise way. If you get behind on payroll taxes, that's considered a criminal offense, and it doesn't get discharged in bankruptcy so that they can come after you personally. So it's pretty serious. So the lawyer told him, <clears throat> You need to run this factory for another six weeks and take what would have been the workers' wages and use that to pay the back taxes because the workers can't sue you criminally and can't come through the corporation. Isn't that? So when, I sh when we showed up the next morning after this had gone on, the, you know, we were standing around this barrel in Lincolnton right outside the, the plant gates. And they told me a story. They said that the owner had driven up in a blue Mercedes Benz the day before, gotten behind the gate, locked the gate, and told them, I don't have anything for you, not even an apology. I did what I had to do. And then they told me, they said, what we did was we started taking up a collection. We were going to give it to the guard if he would let us in, and we were going to kill him <laughs> on the spot. <clears throat> so I'm 25 years old. I've got red hair down to my shoulders. I'm a hippie. And they start talking about this. And then they said, well, you know, this barrel right where we are here, we had a Klan rally last night around this barrel, and we burned it, and it still were embers burning there. And I'm thinking, okay, this is Lincolnton. Anybody here from Lincolnton? Okay, well, good. I'm... And to make a longer story short, we worked with the worker group. We put together a group. We had an adult educator who had spent her entire uh, adult life teaching in Tanzania. So she was accustomed to uh, race and ethnicity issues. And at one of our workshops, she, she said, I, I can't do this. I can't do it. You're gonna, Martin, you're gonna have to take over because there's so much hostility here between black and white in Lincolnton. We couldn't find a place to meet. We couldn't find a church that was neutral. And the two pieces of this story that are both funny and tragic, the first one was we actually rented buses and took them to the plant to pick up the workers to drive to Greensboro where the bankruptcy court was being held. So this is just a few months later after this shooting. And I got there, and as the folks got on the bus, I actually frisked them and made them put their guns back in the trunks of their car. They were going to take their guns with them. They couldn't get the guard to let them in, but by God, they were going to get him in Greensboro. <clears throat> it was a very rough place. The woman who fell in love with me, one of the leaders of the group, and this is a true story, her term of endearment for, for me, she says, you don't like anything, but I think you did say you like Dolly Parton's music. I said, and I, you know, they hated unions, they hated, it was a really interesting thing. She, she started calling me from then on. Well, you're just gonna be my wormy little bastard. <laughs> that was her term of endearment for, for me. And I said, okay, that's uh... Well, so we started doing teaching with the worker group. They elected three black workers and three white workers. Never happened in that county ever before. To be the leadership group to try to govern what would be a worker co-op textile mill that would emerge from all this shenanigans we had of how to recoup their back pay, use it as a down payment on purchasing the factory, and running it into the future. And any of you who've done legal bylaws for any organization, and Jane, this is no reflection on you, my former law partner, but bylaws are about the most boring thing you can possibly do. So I went down there and I, I made a profession out of it every weekend for three or four weekends to talk about co-op bylaws. And the, the leaders were all there. And on the, on the last weekend that I went down, uh, one of the women who had been part of the group wasn't there, but I continued on. And at the end of the hour, two hours of bylaw uh, presentation, I asked, well, where is Doris? And they looked at me and they were, you know, silent for a moment. And they looked at me and they said, you haven't heard? I said, I haven't heard what? They said, well, Doris 
because we missed the six weeks of pay at the end of the factory shutting down, the Employment Security Commission treated that as a severance payment that we were owed, so we couldn't collect any unemployment for another six weeks after that. And Doris's infant daughter, who was the exact same age as my son, or about the same age, basically got sick and she said she didn't have enough money to take her child to the hospital and the child died. She's not here because they're at the funeral burying her child. And for me, all of a sudden, and they hadn't told me during this whole session until after it was over, and at that point, this stopped being a philosophy class. It stopped being about the principle of socialism and capitalism. It really became a fundamental struggle for just dignity and justice and it sort of kept that kind of passion ever since. So, you know, that's, we, all of us were forged in those early 1980s. And this is one story out of 20. I mean, it's things that you see that if you don't have economic security, your family is not safe. And the number of children we have living in North Carolina in poverty is absolutely a sin. I mean, it is abysmal. So, as I get into sin, I will actually, see this is roundabout, <laughs> came back to your question about what self-help embodied two principles when we started out that we called tithing principles. The first, so that sounds biblical, right? I mean, you, you can take the, uh, you know, take the kid out of the Baptist church, but you can't necessarily get all the Baptists out of him. <laughs> Our first principle is what we call tithing to the future. In our first year, we had $2,000 of budget for all of self-help. And there were five of us working full-time, so you know, we weren't as good at numbers then as we got later on with credit. But we took out of that $2,000, $200, and put it into reserves. The next year we had 4,400 and we put $440 into reserves. And every year for 25, 30 years, we would take a tithe that we would put into being strong financially. And just to motivate that for one second, in 1988, we were part of a group that got the first North Carolina appropriation for minority economic development. And it was a total of maybe four or five million dollars from the state of North Carolina, which shocked us. We couldn't imagine that government would actually provide money to help poor people do community development. And it was sort of a random thing, but we got it. And then it took me six months of sitting, this was your governor at that time, uh, <laughs> and they impounded the money. They said anything that is sponsored by Mickey Michal, so there was a Durham connection, and Lieutenant Governor Bob Jordan, who had been the sponsor in the Senate, has to be corrupt and bad, and we're not gonna let this money be released for the reverse discrimination of serving black and female small businesses. So we went and sat in their office, and we had newspapers starting to pound them, and after six months, they said, oh my God, we've had enough. <laughs> And they released the money and we made 37 loans to small businesses across the state, all of whom except one uh, succeeded without any late payments. And even the one was eventually successful but had to struggle to get there. So I thought this was the greatest thing ever. You know, we had $2 million that came to self-help that we could lend out, which meant even at a modest interest rate of uh, 6%, we were earning $120,000 to pay for the staff. So the next year I said, well, we're gonna do the same thing. And I get this call, a bunch of you know Abdul Rashid. Who here knows Rashid, who's a world leader? Rashid calls me, six foot four guy. He's got a Muslim name. He's scary as heck. And he calls me, his voice trembling. He says, Martin, you gotta get your butt down here. There's a legislator who claims that you refuse to make a loan in his district. And if you don't make this loan, not only is he going to kill this new bill, because I put in a new bill for $2 million for housing, 
I'm going to kill that bill, but I'm going to kill legal services and every program in the state of North Carolina that deals with poor people. Okay, well, you can imagine. I was redheaded and pissed off. I jumped in my car, drove down, met with this guy, and he tells me, I want you to make this loan. I said, well, I'm not, I can't make the loan. I made a loan to a heating and air conditioning business last year that I knew didn't quite work and couldn't pay it back, but the need was so great, we did it anyway. And eventually that failed, and I had to help that man move his family out of his house because we had done harm to him by giving him a loan he couldn't pay back. I'm thinking, that's a pretty compelling story, right? You don't, I'm not going to do this again. There's nothing you can do. He looks at me and he says, I don't want to hear any more of your cute stories. You're going to make this loan or I'm going to make you pay. And I said, okay, let me think about this for a second. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll withdraw my bill so that we will make it easy on you. There's no reason for you to harm the other programs in North Carolina that deal with poor people. But there are two things I need to tell you. Number one is there's nobody at self-help who needs this grant for their salaries. It's a capital grant that we're going to use to make loans for home ownership. And if you don't make it, that's just people we can't help. But no one's going to get a bonus if it comes through. And no one's going to get laid off if it doesn't come through. And the second thing I need to tell you is on Friday afternoon at 2 o'clock, I'm going to hold a press conference and tell the world exactly why we pulled it out and what you said to us and what pressure you put on us. And I'm going to do everything I can to embarrass you as much as I possibly can. And he sits there. He, he's a big old guy. All these guys, all of them are big barrel-chested guys. <laughs> and I looked at him. We got you know, eyes locked, and 90 seconds of no words whatsoever, just silent stare. And he finally says, well, I guess losing a whole state program is not worth it for one loan. Okay, well, the moral of that story is not Martin is a mean SOB, which I am. <laughs> the story was that we weren't dependent on his money. We had been building reserves and building some financial strength that I think is ultimately critical to having the integrity of making promises to uh, uh, poor communities and then following through. So that tithing to the future is a really critical piece of self-help and we've done that more than any organization I know of in the entire country. And now we've built up to where self-help has almost two billion dollars in assets and four or five hundred million dollars of reserves but it all started with a $77 uh, bake sale. The second tithing principle, then I'll, I'll, I'll pass this on, is what we call tithing to the movement. So when we were successful in raising a grant to support our operating from a foundation, your $3,000 grant, Joanne, we would say we need to commit 10% of our time towards assisting other organizations in the same field that we're in. That if self-help grows to be the only oak tree in a field, it can still be blown over by a strong wind. But if we have a whole forest of trees, a whole group of voices that are fighting for justice and freedom, we're a whole lot stronger. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, charity on our part. This was just pure strategy of how we would implement social change was that we needed to have a whole network of organizations that would stand up to fight payday lenders and make them leave the state of North Carolina, which happened a couple of decades later, which was great. And so we've done that over the years, where whether it was Thad working with uh, uh, a black credit union uh, in Fayetteville or Winston-Salem or Chatham County, or working, I'm now working with a $7 million credit union, which is very tiny, that serves farm workers in Apopka, Florida, that there's this commitment from self-help to stay engaged as a movement and not just simply as one organization trying to uh, carry its mission. So I think those two things together have really shaped a lot of what we have become, even though they're, they're sort of abstract. 
they were very concrete for us. And I'll stop there. I think now would be a good time to open it up to questions from you all. So I'm curious as to why it is that you chose North Carolina in particular, and then also to what degree did the civil rights movement and that whole discussion, or even black power, the whole discussion of uh, black capitalism um, that was emerging during the 1970s, to what degree did it have an influence or just the whole era of discussion of uh, economic development? How did that influence? Well, North Carolina is the easy part of that answer. Um, Martin grew up here, and we both went to college here, so we wanted to be here. Um, and we thought Durham was cool before Durham was cool. <laughs> way before Durham was cool, so. Um, the second part of that is probably a little, I, you know, I probably could make something up and Mark probably will. <laughs> but I think, I think we were probably pretty unschooled in that. I mean, we were, you know, pretty close to being straight out of school and hadn't been in North Carolina for a while. I mean, I was straight out of school at least. Mark was out of grad school, so he might have a more intelligent answer for you on that part. Martin. So, for me, the, the part about North Carolina Bonnie answered about the civil rights engagement. Uh, my personal story, which unfortunately many of you... Yeah. Okay, I think that I'm still on good ground. Where I was going. I'm going to try this. So my own story was I grew up in an all-black community. My father was a raging Jesse Helms Republican who wanted his four sons to learn how to work like he did growing up on a farm in eastern North Carolina. And so he moved to this property on the south side of Greensboro, and I don't think he had any clue that it was going to radicalize his four sons. So I was born in 1954, the year that Brown versus Board of Education was decided. Greensboro was the first city in the South to announce that it would desegregate its schools. It has a long, long history of Quaker influence and Underground Railroad. But the truth was Greensboro was the very last city to actually desegregate its schools. So even though I was born in this significant year, my high school didn't start desegregating until I was 15 years old. Uh, I grew up in this community playing basketball with all of my friends, and uh, the two quick little stories, and my apologies to people who've heard me preach this before, but it's really critical to self-help, is that the very first black student in my high school was from my neighborhood. And we rode a bus together about 20 minutes. I was, uh, uh, as big as I am now, I was about two feet shorter then than I am now. And kids being what they would, they would thump this kid on the back of his head on the way to school. And unlike any other student in my high school, uh, he, he, and he didn't play basketball, so I didn't know him very well, but he wore a suit and tie every day. No one, no one wore a suit and tie to high school. And so after two months of torment, I finally had the courage to go up from the back of the bus and say, look, this guy is someone we know. He's from our neighborhood. Let's just cut this crap out. And I'm standing there, and this guy from the back of the bus comes lumbering up, and he's not looking at me, so I'm not really paying attention to him. And he comes up, and he backhands me across my nose and knocks me down flat on the floor. My nose is slightly bleeding, not badly. And this young man who was from my neighborhood, pulled me up into the seat beside him. He always sat by himself, I'm embarrassed to say. And he pulled me up. He's an 11th grader. I think I was a 9th grader, maybe 10th. And what he said to me is, he says, Martin, you can't fight hate with anger. All you can do is live your life in a, in a way that will show people how they should be. He's an 11th grader. You know, anything I knew about Martin Luther King was not positive. At that stage, he won't even remember that. But he made this impression on me. 
The next year, there were 10% of the students in my high school who were African American. And it was not easy. Every morning we had fist fights and riots around the lockers in my high school. It was, it was tough. And my very best friend came to me and he said, Martin, I want to run for student government office. He was a year younger than me who had started. And uh, he was this young, uh, black, charismatic kid who walked on the balls of his feet. He was just a really good looking, uh, incredibly uh, smart. He says, I've decided I want to run for student government office, but I don't think I can win by myself. I want you to run with me. You've been valedictorian of everything. You're president of your class, and we need to run together as a team. I looked at him. I said, you know, I'm pretty good at math. That doesn't sound like a very good idea to me <laughs> right off. And I went home that night, and I was thinking, you know, I don't really want to be in student government anyway. So what difference does it make to me? It had to be really hard for him to ask me to be an ally to him. And so I went back the next day, and I said, sure, let's run together. And we ran together, and I think I was vice president, and he was secretary of the Student Government Association, and we won. I tell people the first and last political election I ever wanted to be in. <laughs> and this kid, we actually joked at that time when we couldn't even imagine a President Obama, we said, my friend John may become the first black president of the United States. And we, we believe that, and we joke about it, but we really didn't believe it. I went off to college, uh, my friend who's a year younger stayed home, and he was tutoring young kids on a basketball court behind my house in Greensboro. And the, the kids were nine years old and 10 years old, and there was another tutor from across town in Greensboro who came, and while they were jumping doing layups, this guy dropped a two-bullet Derringer. It looked like a toy gun, a little itty-bitty thing, down onto the pavement. My friend went over to him and said, you know, what the hell are you thinking? You can't be bringing guns around these little kids. This is dangerous. And this guy didn't say anything. He went back to his car, put two bullets into his Derringer, came back to the basketball court and shot my friend through the neck. And he bled out and died on the playground behind my house. So for me, I made this pledge at that point that I would spend the rest of my life living for the two of us, not just for the one of me. And so I've had death threats from the Klan. I've had death threats from you name it. And I would say that that sort of sense of black power and civil rights, if the world were a just place, I would be a jazz trumpet player <laughs> right now. Or I would still be chasing some NBA team trying to play basketball somewhere. Those were my loves, that and chasing girls. Uh, when I was in high school, but it wasn't. And so the calling for people of our generation, of our time, was to translate civil rights into economic opportunity. And we, we went a long path of figuring that out, but our passion for what we do was 100% informed by the civil rights struggle and just a yearning for freedom and justice. That, but, but it was personal for each one of us. I just want to say, I think, you know, the, the way that the, our personal experiences motivated us to do what we've done, I think that's in some ways what's lacking now. Um, the people that are making a lot of the decisions for people um, in legislative and other kind of policy decisions, I think there's such a sense of isolation now. And so I think part of what we need to do is to make those decisions more personal for people. And so um, that's part of the work for all of us is how do we make how do we bring those personal experiences to people when there's so much sense of isolation, uh, separation? Um, my story is different from Martin, but you know I've got, I think a lot of us in that generation of desegregation um, have similar stories. Um, and those of us who've been working in this kind of, you want to call it movement work or, or whatever, we have our own, our own kinds of stories that keep us connected and keep us moving forward. And so how do we bring that to other people who are disinterested? Just a simple question. How 
Do we want a mic? Yeah. It's right, uh, right there. How unique is self-help in the country? Are there equivalent or peer organizations elsewhere, or are you unique? There are probably 500 organizations that are similar to self-help in terms of doing community development, lending, and building houses, and building businesses, and you know, funding healthcare centers. There's a lot of those. Uh, self-help is larger than any of them. So we're unique in that we have a bigger voice. We've got uh, uh, more resources. And that may just be we're just older. You know, we started before it was cool, and then uh, we grew. The thing I think that is somewhat unique about self-help is that, and it's sort of a reflection of, of all of our ADD characters here, which we have plenty of, is that we believe that building, sometimes at self-help, we'll talk about a bicycle as the metaphor, that your front wheel is your mission, it leads, it goes first, and your back wheel is financial sustainability, and if you don't have both in rough balance, you'll end up toppling over, you'll end up unbalanced if you're riding on just one wheel or the other. So I think what has made us unique is that we are really willing to yell and fight in a way that most of the other organizations, and I think they will, I mean, that, but we, we just got to that early. And I actually think that for all the billions of dollars of loans that we've made and the tens and 50,000 families that we've provided financing for home loans to, who almost all have paid us back. I mean, it's just an unbelievably remarkable uh, track record. I think that what really has made us unique is the ability to translate that into policy and really fight to try to put payday lenders out of business in the world, to try to stop subprime lenders in 1998. We saw what was going to happen and testified at the Federal Reserve, I must have testified myself 10 times in the US Senate and House banking committees saying, and so when I hear people say, oh, this was a, you know, a tidal wave, that no, the perfect storm, no one could have anticipated this. I'm like, that is so much BS, that this was so obvious that if you make loans and destroy people using loans that can't be repaid, you're gonna end up with the equivalent of 3,000 different Hurricane Katrinas all over the United States destroying, but not in destroying neighborhoods, but without being featured on the front page of the, of the nightly news. And that's what we've had over the last eight years, is we had the single largest transfer of family wealth from black and Latino families out of the community in the history of the world. The largest transfer, a trillion dollars or more, ever in history. And it was all preventable and knowable and was basically a failure of politicians. I gave a speech recently where I said, you know the problem with politics is that the Republicans in Congress are evil and the Democrats are gutless. <laughs> so I don't know which one is worse, but the two together means that it's really hard to stop a problem that is absolutely obvious that it's going to destroy people and communities. So there is a whole movement of organizations all over the country, uh, and we're part of, a, of, of that group. We try to do institutes where we bring folks in so that we can share contacts with each other. Uh, and I think it's the potential for a real seedling movement of organizations, but it hadn't really proven its power yet. One or two more. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, you first and then... Oops. Martin, could, could you speak a little bit about uh, the Haytai Development Corporation and Nat White and some of the work that you guys did in the very early days as well as this, the big gap that we still have between the haves and the have-nots in Durham. We've seen great prosperity and great things happen in our downtown, but yet and still, we still have some challenges. And I'm, I'm curious if you're satisfied with where we are in the local community right now? Uh, yeah, I recently had a, had a meeting with Livonia Allison, 
where I was saying, I'm going to make you happy about this. And she says, you cannot make me happy. And so, you know, it's, it's really hard to be satisfied at all right now. In 1984, when we started the credit union, the thing we discovered that was just earth shattering to us, smarter people already knew this, was the disparity in wealth between black and white families. So black families had roughly $3,000 in family wealth in 1984. White families had 38,000, so it was you know, uh, tenfold or greater disparity in wealth. And wealth disparity plays out in just about everything you can imagine, uh, all across the board. The second thing we found was a fact was that 65% of the wealth of all families, white, black, Latino, Asian, was held in home equity. So if we were gonna make a difference on the disparity in wealth, we had to build the home ownership capacity uh, among people who'd been excluded for years and years. And I can go into a long speech, but I won't. Haytai Development Corporation was very unique. Uh, uh, Nat White Jr., did you know Nat White Sr.? Okay, so Nat White Sr. was like the sweetest human being on the face of the earth. He ran service printing company off Pettigrew Street and basically printed the civil rights literature of the 1960s and 70s, sometimes for free, all across the country. I mean, all across North Carolina, this was the center, their archives was the, was the archives of the civil rights uh, literature for that period. His son, uh, Nat White Jr., who I think lives in Atlanta now, was the f in the first class of black students at Duke University. And so he graduated, he was sort of a, a privileged person who came back to Durham to start what was called the Haytai Development Corporation. I don't know whether you know this, but I knew a lot about that because in those early years I was their lawyer. And you were on the board of Haytai Development Corporation. And the funny, I mean, so this is just, life has lots of turns and it's funny, is, is Nat White was a very passionate guy who would not take no for an answer. And you would think I would love that, but because I was his lawyer, I was saying, do it within this way or you're gonna get, you're gonna get arrested. And I did this disclosure statement for his community offering. Anybody here remember the, uh, the True Value hardware store that was in the Haytai Heritage Shopping Center? So this, you know, and I remember sitting with, with Nat White saying, the, dem the studies all say that the people around the store are renters. So you need to have items in the hardware store that would appeal to renters, because that's, he says, no, I want it to appeal to homeowners. That's what we aspire to be. I said, yeah, but, you're a little ahead of your time. We need to get the homeowners first and then have something you can sell. So the business failed, and a lot of people in the community were really mad that they had bought a $100 share. And Nat, <laughs> y'all, anybody remember this? <laughs> he got caught by the police climbing over the fence when they had put it into receivership, and they, I think they put him in, in uh, they arrested him for a short period of time. So I'm there trying to get him out and thank goodness we've done this disclosure statement or they would have charged him with, with securities fraud. But the Haytai Development Corporation and his passion and vision was really unbelievable. He was way, way ahead of his time. Durham has made progress in lots of ways, but we are now 35 years from when self-help started in 1980. I can console myself by saying it would have been worse if we weren't there, but the disparity between black and white is greater now than it was when we started in 1980. If you just took, and this is my last sort of boring fact, took 1979, the distribution of wealth among families, and, and that was nothing to write home about. As I just said, in 1980, we were embarrassed about the disparity in wealth between black and white. But if over the last 35, 36 years, we had stayed at that level of inequality, 
the median family in Durham would have $15,000 more income than it has today. So if you think about problems of housing, problems of health care, problems of food, all the things that we think about, what difference would it make if every family had $15,000 more in take home income each year, just if we were to maintain the almost obscene level of inequality that we had in 1979. So am I satisfied? I am so pissed off that I don't even know how to stand it. And you could say, well, okay, let's give up. But either you give up and walk away or you say it's time to start rebuilding. The black community in Durham was really significantly harmed by subprime mortgage loans that caused the home ownership rate to drop by eight or nine percentage points. So I can look at it and say this was one of the greatest setbacks and injustice in our time, and it is, but that's just a calling for us to get younger people. You know, Reinhold Niebuhr, have you heard this quote? He says, nothing ever good can be accomplished in a single lifetime. So any of us who are actually committed to that long arc of justice, we've got to think about how we bring the next generation along because it's going to take a long time. We are winning little step by step, but it's not a short-term path. I was just going to add to that. It is truly disheartening to imagine all of the good work that we did with our subprime loans that were fixed rate to lower income folks, loans that we bought from banks and other financial institutions, and to have that whole concept to be turned on its head and with deliberate effort, as Martin was saying, to mislead and, and really defraud people using these complicated instruments that had the other exact inverse effect of what we had done. So I think you had a question over there, and I think we probably need to wrap up after that. Thank you. Um, can you tell us what uh, financial and uh, political interests were working against you in the early days, and is that something that you still have to be fighting against? <laughs> it, it wasn't so much that folks were working against us when we were little and small. We just didn't really make enough difference uh, on a macro, on a big level, for people to care. But as we got bigger and stronger, when we did lead a coalition to stop payday lending in North Carolina, when we led a coalition to prevent Blue Cross Blue Shield from converting from nonprofit status to for-profit status. When in 2001, we were able to pass legislation that put, you know, it's not exactly radical. We went back to what had been the law for 70 years, saying that the maximum rate of interest that you could charge on a small loan is 36% in interest rate. Okay, 36% is highly unreasonable. You know, that's really way too low. And the payday lenders, that was, this was the first state that payday lenders had ever gotten a toehold in and then been forced out of. And then we started the Center for Responsible Lending that sent teams of two like Noah's Ark to all the different states around the country to try to pass similar legislation. And at one point, the payday lenders, Bonnie hates it when I tell this story, but it's a good one. Payday lenders, one of their board members came to me and he says, Martin, I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy what we're gonna do to you. He says, our trade association of payday lenders, which charge 400 to 500% interest rate, has declared in its meeting that you are our number one enemy in the world. And I tell people when I, when I hear that, I said, I started having these little quivers of, not fear, but embarrassment, because my mother used to say, Martin, the worst sin of all is pride. And I was sort of, I was sort of feeling kind of good about that. You know, this is a good, a good thing. He said we put up ten million dollars 
not to defeat you, but to destroy you personally. And they hired the same firm that did the Swift Boat campaign. They put articles out that had pictures of Bonnie, even though she'd been gone from self-help for 14 years, I think, 2005, 2006. And they really have come after us. So the thing that will, you know, this is self-justification for why you have to fight, that I think every little step of civil rights or economic freedom is a fight. And for everything in the status quo that we see that you think is bad, that should be changed, the kind of targeting of African-American youth in terms of prison sentences or drug crime, on every single issue, there is some industry that is making money off keeping the status quo exactly the way it is. So if you ever get to a point where you're strong enough to actually challenge that, uh, there's a lot of resistance and it will come out with money and a level of viciousness that, I mean, look at Planned Parenthood, look at what happened to uh, ACORN, uh, that if you're going to fight on this level, the interests that have money to keep the status quo exactly the way it is are going to put a lot into fighting back. Just want to thank everybody for coming tonight and um, excited that this has been recorded so that hopefully people who are not here tonight can, can hear it and thank everybody for learning more about self-help and for being a part of it. Uh, everybody had their hands raised, whether as a member or depositor or uh, user of some of our buildings or whatever. So thank you very much and thank you all. Thank you so much for coming and thank you all for sharing your story with this amazing German institution.